Okay, everybody, welcome very much to this week's SOAS Department of Development Studies and Bloomsbury DTC for the Social Sciences Seminar Series. We're really delighted tonight to welcome Stephanie Barrientos to speak to us. She's Professor in the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. She's researched and published widely on different aspects of global production networks and value chains, including gender, agribusiness, employment, trade, labor standards, as well as corporate social responsibility and fair and ethical trade. This research is very grounded in nature and has been undertaken in a wide variety of contexts across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. So as a leading academic in the field of global, global production and gender, we're delighted to have her here tonight to present some new work to us under the title Retail Shift, Transforming Work and Gender in Global Production. Also joining us is Paul O'Connell, a reader in law here at SOAS. His research expertise encompasses the impact of globalization on human rights, and that makes him ideally placed to act as a discussant on Professor Varientos' presentation. Um, for anybody who wants to tweet, you can use the, the hashtag SOASDevStudies. Uh, and with no further ado, really, I'll hand over to you, Stephanie. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay back there? So if you can't, just, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be here. And uh, SOAS is an institution that I've had a long association with, so, so it's certainly a privilege. And in fact, I think one of my early seminars was even at SOAS at the beginning of all this work. Um, I should just say that, um, I mean, it's the usual <laughs> start. This is very much work in progress. Um, so basically, I'm working on a book looking at gender, the transformation of work and gender in global value chains, which draws on kind of many years of research. So I'm just sort of going to give a synopsis of some of the kind of core arguments and then some of the um, some of the um, uh, case studies, at least a kind of a, a brief view of some of the case studies. Does that work okay? okay. Um, so just firstly, just a, a bit of an overview of, of retail, the, the global retail shift, and, and I kind of come at this from a fairly empirical and pragmatic perspective, but I think it's really important to get a kind of context of what we're talking about. Oh, I've actually changed the order slightly. Then I'm going to look at some of the analytical approaches that I use, um, and that draws on value chain, uh, global production network analysis, but also very importantly, uh, feminist political economy and labor studies. Um, and then look at some of the dynamics that I've, through the research that we've seen in terms of economic and social upgrading and downgrading, this is improved, which I'll define later, but which is really when things are getting better for workers or worse. Um, and, and give you some case study examples of the combinations of the two and then some concluding reflections. So just a little bit. Um, I mean, it, it's, uh, I think, just a little bit about kind of what I'm talking about in terms of global re the global retail shift. And we're all used to kind of working, uh, sort of buying goods, um, particularly with urbanization. More and more people are dependent on markets to buy goods. Um, and sort of traditionally, it would have been kind of small free markets, small shops, etc. But there's really a big shift been going on in retail. We've seen it here in Europe and in North America. But what Reardon calls waves of, of retail shifts, where the same shifts that we've seen in, in Europe and, and, and Latin America, sorry, Europe and North America are also taking place in Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, and, but particularly Africa now. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. And just basically, before I go into the detail, in a kind of retail value chain, this is not a traditional free market. So I'm always, when I use the words about neoliberalism, for example, I think you have to be cautious. We live in, a, in an almost a post-neoliberal world, if Donald Trump has his way in a post-post. But anyway, we can discuss that later on, because certainly what he's doing is, um, or his agenda is certainly a pushback on what I'm about to talk about. And, and in a value chain, unlike a free market, there are key lead players particularly retailers, who coordinate what goes on, and I'll give you some examples in a second, where producers are tied in through networks, supply networks. They're not just free, free um, producers and suppliers who, who simply work according to price movements on their own. And increasingly in these retail value chains, you have very high levels of female employment, feminization of employment, what Standing discusses. 
um, very, very common. But I don't just look at this from a sort of commercial side. What I'm really interested in is the way in which these retail value chains are, soci are socially embedded in very different contexts. And the inter particularly if you're interested in the gender dimension, um, in quite complex ways. So it's really that kind of complex analysis that I'm trying to draw out. In a situation where you do have lead firms who are uh, both suppliers and retailers who are, have a very dominant position, have, have a very sort of um, strong, powerful position. Just, you don't need to read all the figures, but just to, there is some data behind this. Um, just a little bit on on the, on who it is we're talking about. Now, I think we're all familiar with the Walmarts and the Tesco's and um, the Carrefour's of the world. Those those are well known. Um, and just to, to think a little bit about the, the the dominance that these retailers have. Um, so, for example, Walmart is one of the largest companies in the world. Its annual revenue is the equivalent of the GDP of Switzerland. So it's approximately the equivalent in size or strength of a country. Um, it's, it operates in 28 countries. It sources in over 80, from over 80 countries. Walmart doesn't go out into the free market or wholesale market to see if there's goods available and what price it can negotiate. In other words, the kind of traditional neoclassical or neoliberal model of economics. It pre-programs, pre-plans, at least nine months in advance, it coordinates its supply chain across all of those countries. It owns a satellite, and its satellite tracks the movement of all the goods through the distribution chain. It is a highly planned, or I wouldn't say planned, but coordinated engagement um, uh, in, in all the supply um, countries. It operates a set of standards, all suppliers, it's got over 100,000 suppliers, in total, it all have to comply with the standards in which it requires across all its sourcing countries. So this isn't a sort of classic neoliberal, neoclassical economic free market model. And really what interests me is if you look at the, at the, um, the logos, if you like, to the right, these are logos of companies, not European or North American companies, uh, ShopRite, for example, is a South African company, or Sensosud is the Chilean company, which operates um, in five countries across Latin America. Uh, ShopRite is the South African country that operates in 17 countries across Africa. They all work on very similar pro principles to Walmart, uh, so exactly the same as I've just described. MassMart, I don't know if any of you are familiar with MassMart, MassMart is a South African Supermarket, you might know it under its MassMart Holdings owns Game and a whole other load of shops, so they do come under different names. MassMart was is a South African company that uh, operates in 14 countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Plus. My data is a little bit out of date, and I know they were opening in more countries. Uh, Walmart now has a 52% holding in MassMart, so effectively Walmart now is one of the largest supermarkets in Africa. So the kind of trends that we've seen in Europe and North America are increasingly playing out um, in Africa, Asia, um, and, and, um, and uh, Latin America. And I think we're all familiar with the fair trade mark, which you'll see down in the right-hand corner. I don't know if you can all see it, but what it says underneath is fair trade Africa. You'll get the same in Asia, there's fair trade India, there's fair trade Brazil. So a lot of the sort of consumer movements that we've seen in Europe and North America are now being replicated, to, at least to some extent, um, in Africa, Asia and Latin America. So, so really it's analysing this kind of retail shift and how it plays out and what are the implications for both uh, producers, workers and consumers um, is what I've been looking at. Um, but this, in this talk, what I want to concentrate on is the gender dimension, and I think there's a very important gender dimension to the whole story. I mean, the first is, what's driving all of this? Um, and I think urbanisation, rising incomes is really a critical factor in it. Um, clearly, if you're having, if the majority, 50% or more of the population of a developing country is now living in the urban sector, the possibility of producing food or self-production, you know, local subsistence production becomes much more diminished. 
Um, but also kind of rising incomes, technological advance, the whole pattern of global sourcing, the way in which um, uh, big retailers control um, uh, their supply chains. Also a really important factor is the feminization of employment. This works in a number of ways, part, and I, I can only briefly touch on it, but, but partly that supermarket growth, particularly supermarkets, but there are many other types of retailers as well, Supermarket growth especially is based on the commercialization of goods traditionally produced in the home that they can now produce commercially, make a profit from, and employ women to produce those goods, often in the supply chain, which I'll come back to in a minute, in order to sell to their consumers, who and they're very focused on their consumers, um, and they all are, not just here in, in the north, but also in the global south, um, the majority of whom are women, and they know it. And these are buyer-led firms who are really customer-focused, so they, they analyze their customer base very, very closely. I'm careful about the time, but I first got onto the gender side of all of this many years ago when I was interviewing a category manager for a UK supermarket, a man, and he started to talk to me about gender, and I was sort of sat back and said, whoa, wait, 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 wait a minute, I'm meant to be the person raising issues about gender, why are you raising it out of the blue? And he said, well, that's the majority of our customers, of course we're, we're interested in gender issues, we have someone in the team focused specifically on, on monitoring trends, especially for women. It's estimated that globally women are, have, I mean, we can debate whether they control it, but they're responsible um, for $20 trillion spend in retail per annum. And of course, again, companies are aware of this. And with rising incomes, this is likely uh, to increase. So it, 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 assuming we continue with growth in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, assuming we increase, continue with urbanization, and assuming we incre continue with the feminization of employment, these trends are likely to continue. Big assumptions there. Trump will certainly stop all of that if he can get his way. Uh, this is just very brief, but um, we know that in these supply chains, and there's been a lot of research, um, including here at SOAS um, and in, I think, many universities, about the feminization of employment within the supply chain. So these, the, 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 the expansion of these kind of retail value chains has generated a significant amount of employment um, these are just some examples, um, Bangladesh garments, uh, 3.5 3 to 4 million workers, 80% of them are female. That's in a country which, in which women traditionally are not meant to work, not in paid work, very important. Um, India garments, the data is often quite difficult to get, 5.6 million workers, but a significant number, um, and that's where the data is, is much more blurred, um, is uh, work in the informal production. For me, and I'll go into it in a second, the supply chain really links all sections of, of types of work. And we can carry on in, in cocoa, it's 1.5 million to 2 million smallholder farmers are in, if you like chocolate, which I tend to like. Um, uh, 1.5 to 2 million households are involved in that, smallholder households. 25% female farmers, but the research we've done shows that nearly half the actual work is done by women, even though cocoa is seen as a male crop. So women play major roles in, in, in many of these supply chain. There are big debates, however, about whether this benefits women or not. Um, there's one very strong school and plenty of evidence for it, that it's detrimental, that women are uh, brought in as cheap labor, they're over, uh, heavily exploited, they're very insecure, they're very precarious, the type of work that they have, as soon as there's any kind of downturn, they're pushed out. There's another um, school, um, which uh, particularly uh, uh, with Nyla Kabir and others, who've argued, yeah, but at the same time, so it's not denying that, but at the same time, the work can be empowering for women. It gives them an independent income that they've not had access to before, it gives them social access, um, it allows them to begin to organise collectively in ways they've not been able to do before and therefore it has the potential at least, if not the reality, of being empowering. So there's a big debate there as to whether it's beneficial or to what extent. 
And as I said, I think really what I'm trying to do is to look at both the pros and the cons. I, I think there's evidence for both sides in those debates, to be honest. Um, and therefore, it's really trying to understand what the dynamics are and how this is playing out in this kind of con context of rapid shift, retail shift, if you like, that's going on in the global economy. A little bit then to think about the sort of analytical approach is to help try and an analyze this. As you probably noticed, I think a free market model does not, doesn't, for me, just doesn't crack it. Um, so in, in analyze, I mean, my first work was looking at the sort of gender dimension of this kind of work. I very rapidly realized you had to understand what, if you're looking at women workers, you had to understand what was going on along the whole supply chain to understand what, what was happening for, for them in their place of work and what the dynamics were. And value chain analysis helped, I think, has helped to do this. Um, and the essence of a value chain is that the value chain links all stages of production. So production, right from their very first inputs through production, distribution, through the retailer to the final customer. Um, and as you go along, these are co coordinated by, these chains are coordinated a bit like the Walmart example by, by lead firms. Those could be um, uh, producers, lead suppliers, or they could be, and usually are as well, lead retailers. And they really govern what goes along, what happens along the chain. The dimension to value chain analysis that I'm really interested in, uh, and there's, there's a lot of people who critique value chain analysis for being too narrow, too firm focused, and I think, I think those are, are, are le very legitimate critiques or criticisms to be made. Uh, but at the same time, I think you need to, under, un, in my, from my perspective, I need to understand what those commercial dynamics are in order to get to the next level, which is how those value chains are then embedded in different types of labor markets, which themselves are gendered. But in socio-economic and cultural contexts, which can, be, can vary a lot. So if you take just one supply chain where sourcing of the same product could be from, um, well, I've just fruit is one that I've worked uh, for many years on. So the same product, as if you go through a bunch of grapes, as you go through the an, through the year, well, if you go into Tesco, the, the bunch of grapes looks exactly the same. It's been sourced from Spain. It's been sourced from Morocco at the next stage. It's been sourced from Chile and South Africa. It's been sourced from India and then back into Europe, into Spain. Table grapes, not usually France. Um, and so it goes around. To you as the consumer, it looks exactly the same. The socio cultural um, context in which that sourcing has taken place is completely different. So it's this, it, what really interests me is the way, and, and women form the majority probably about on average in most countries around 60% of the workers who will have produced those grapes. Um, so what interests me is, is what, how is this interaction between this kind of commercial dynamic and, this, and the diverse uh, gendered em, um, em, embeddedness, if you like, of these value chains, how do they play out in context where, as I said earlier, where value chains are really disrupting traditional reproductive work in, in complex ways and in multiple ways, um, at, 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 at including at household and community levels. And I'll give you an example of that later from, from COCO. So my core question really is, um, how is the relation between commercial production and social reproduction being reconfigured in the context of these retail value chains? And how is that transforming gendered patterns of work? So just a little bit more about the kind of um, uh, the, the analysis that I draw on. Um, I, th I mentioned that I draw on global value chain and global production network analysis. And these are two, for those of you who are into this, and I know that I mean, I'm one of the crackpots who are, there are, the value chain approach, which was Jereffi and Kaplinski and others, is very, very focused on those commercial linkages between firms and how those play out, how those chains are governed, but really the inter-firm relations. But what they don't really do is look at this embeddedness side. So there's another body of literature, which is the global production network literature, which is really from economic geography, Peter Dickens, um, and Mint Dickens and many others, um, which look at the societal embeddedness and really look at the power relations and the uneven way in which production um, and, and commercial sourcing, if you like, plays out. 
Now, I draw on both of those, but I think both have their limitations. Neither of them look particularly at labour and neither of them look particularly at gender. I then draw on labour process and labour studies theory, and that gives you a lot of insights into um, issues around the employment relationship and capital-labour relation. Now, I think that's important to understand my concern with focusing on a sort of traditional employment relation, and I'll go into that in a little bit in a second, is that in these value chains, when you've got a company like Walmart, whoever, I mean, that's just an example, effectively controlling or having a major say in the conditions of work that take place in supplier firms thousands of miles away, it raises questions about the traditional capital, labour and employment relationship. Um, and I think we need to look at that. And also in both of these approaches, uh, the, the household tends to be overlooked. I'll come back to that. Uh, feminist political economy, and I, I draw on quite heavily, so the work of Susan Hemmelwhite, Diane Nelson, who I think you've got coming to speak later on. Um, and many others. And they really look at the, the kind of way in which markets themselves are gendered. Now, the analysis there is focused on markets, not value chains specifically, but, but really on more traditional market analysis. But what they do bring out very strongly is the analysis of the relationship between paid productive and unpaid reproductive work. And I think that dimension of the analysis is really important. And their criticism of conventional economics is that it hasn't, and many other approaches is that they haven't really drawn that in. Um, and um, uh, particularly if you're thinking about the reproductive work, why that's so important for me is because, as I've said earlier, is that supermarkets especially, their growth is based on commercialising reproductive work producing ready-made meals that women would have made in the home, doing, producing ready-made garments that would have been traditionally made in the home. So therefore, that interaction, I think, is really important to analyse if you want to understand fully the dynamics um, of these value chains. Um, keeping going, because I don't want to run out of time. So just thinking about this from, a, from a, what I call a gendered value chain or a production network approach, <coughs> The first thing I think is really important is that, and this is the sort of moving beyond the capi a narrow capital labour relation, is that work in a value chain, I mean work firstly I define as all forms of work which produce goods which go into uh, the value chain. Um, now that could be paid or unpaid, and particularly if you work as I do in, in smallholder farming, a lot of it is unpaid. Informal workers, a lot of it is unpaid. Or there are questions about what the remuneration is and how that, that, that actually plays out. So I think it's very important uh, to, to think of that as a sort of extended form. The next thing is this issue of the fragmentation of work, which I haven't had time to go into a lot, but, but across these value chains, there's, um, uh, if you buy a kind of standard produced product, for example, uh, you've got an iPhone with you, which you would, could easily have bought through a retailer. Well, Apple is a major retailer. Um, you will, that product will have probably been made, I don't quite mean exactly, in pro pro approximately 16 countries. So which component of that is Chinese? China assembles it. Apple, which is the US, sells it, a very large margin. Uh, but the components come from many, 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 many countries. So this fragmentation of work and the, gen the d division of labour across different segments of the value chain is very important to understand. And this issue that I mentioned before, who actually controls the employment relationship in that? Who really ultimately controls what working conditions are like, um, who is employed, how they're employed, um, etc. And there are three dimensions that I'm particularly interested in, and I'll go into, in the commercialization of reproductive work. The first is this issue of value creation. And this goes back, in a sense, and draws on the work of Elson and others, which is that the, the uh, inner gender division of labor in a market economy, many of the activities traditionally underdone, undertaken by women are undervalued. So uh, cooking being, is often, and, and care work, for example, is often socially undervalued. It's not seen as a particularly valuable, and I'm putting this in inverted commas, 
um, activity, and therefore the 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 uh, remuneration which goes to women, because it is largely in a gender division of labour, women who undertake those work, is lower. Now that is societally embedded. It's not been generated by value chains, but of course what the value, the retail value chain does is draw that type of work into the retail value chain and, and, and replicate it, if you like. The next level, and I've not had time to go into it in a lot of detail, skills are really quite important in a retail value chain. If you think of a retailer, and again I'll use Walmart, but it is just a, because it's the biggest, it's nothing else, is it's what they want to do is sell product uh, at a low, the lowest possible price point, if you think about it, there could be many different price points for the same product, but with the maximum quality possible. Now that's the tension, that's what they want to do. You don't, no supermarket wants you to go in and buy a product that's shoddy, falling apart, um, and then ultimately does you some kind of harm, especially, but that's just being at its crudest level. But what they want to compete on is both price and quality. Now, in terms of the quality, a lot of the value enhancement, and I'll use the grape example. In the old days, you'd just get a bunch of grapes, pluck it in a box, the box would go off to the wholesale market, and away the grapes will go. Not now. The grapes get put in the box. The box goes into a packing plant. That packing plant is quite likely 90% female workers. Those workers are, are the ones that make it look all beautiful, pretty, take off the ones that don't look a bit knobbly, put it in the bag that you buy it in with the little zip on it and all the rest that, that finally comes up. That is a major part of the value enhancement of those grapes. Those women workers will, can be paid quite a large level of remuneration for the skills that they bring in doing that. So it's not traditional skills, it's value enhancement. There is a question, though, still in my view, as to whether the remuneration is really reflected, given the additional value they add to those grapes, whether it's really reflected in the remuneration they get. And then finally, the, capture, uh, the value capture. Who actually captures the value in these value chains? So we're keeping moving, because I don't want to, I want to get time for discussion. Um, oh, sorry, very, very importantly, I should, sorry, uh, just, um, just this part of the analysis, I haven't got time to go into too much detail, but I'm also very interested, going back to that debate um, between, you know, the, the kind of, is it all bad for women, is it all good for women debate, um, I think for me, a very, very important dimension is the way in which the articulation between the commercial and the social plays out as a contested process. So in other words, the idea that it's all bad for women kind of assumes, or there is an implicit assumption, not all writers who take that view have it, but that women are kind of passive victims. And that's certainly one of the critiques that Nyla Kabir and others have made um, of that view. Um, it is contested, but it's contested in a very constrained way, and where often the leverage points are, are quite complex that can be drawn on in order to contest the kinds of conditions that, that women face. So, so I think the gendered articulations, if you like, between the commercial and the social is very important. Uh, Jennifer Baer, um, Marion Werner, Pickles and Smith, many of people. Um, Philip Kelly's also been using this articulations approach and he's really looking at it in what he calls gendered reproduction networks, or global reproduction networks, sorry. Um, and he's a, a geographer who's really bringing this into the global production network approach. So there are different ways in which you can look at this, and this is what I want to just now go into a little bit more. This, just to sum up where I've got to so far, just gives you a very, very brief. So you've got the sort of global production going on on this side, social reproduction going on on this side. The value chain that the value chain people look at is this, this sort of circles in the middle. This is a value chain and it links retail, uh, producers, the inputs and the workers. Very simplified. But these retailers are watching what's going on in the household. And the households and the communities themselves often increasingly supply the workers who now increasingly in Africa, Asia and Latin America buy the products that they produce. So it's a little bit Keynesian actually. But anyway, so there are linkages that are going on between between those. But it's how these two articulate. What's the relationship between them? How does it play out? This is really, this area here is really the area that I'm, I'm focused on. 
um, examining. Now, just to give you a little bit, I've been working on a book. It's still work in progress. Just to give you a little bit of um, some of the kind of analysis that I've kind of been doing. The first really is just simply to map out how many women work across the value chain. We know a lot about how many women there are working in the production, and we particularly sort of at lower levels through case studies, but we don't have a lot of information across the value chain. And I think one of the um, um, uh, issues is this whole issue is uh, of the gender inequality. Great, thank you. Of, of gender inequalities and the way in which gender inequality is reflected within value chains. I don't think value chains have created gender inequality or gender subordination, but they certainly reflect and replicate that. But at the same time, in those articulations, they also create spaces to contest um, the, the dominance, uh, if you'd like, the commercial dominance. And they also create spaces for women to organise in ways they haven't been able to necessarily um, in the past and form alliances. So I think we really have to analyse these, um, these, these inequalities, which a lot of the work I've done has, has been involved in. And we know there are a lot of gender inequalities. I don't know if you'd be following the press, but you know if you buy a, a, a black shaver, it costs less than if you buy a pink shaver. Exactly the same, except that pink, I can't tell you how much it costs extra to produce something in pink. In other words, the, the retailers themselves have been taking advantage of gender difference in order to get more spending power out of women than they have out of men. That's a big campaign at the moment that's being run by a number of NGOs. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you've got the other pressures that are going on in terms of the purchasing practices within the supply chain. Those purchasing practices, which again, a lot of the NGO campaigns, Oxfam especially, have run, but others as well, the pressures that some of the retailers put onto suppliers in terms of the conditions they've got to meet, the tight, tight, the just-in-time production, turning stuff around, meeting quality standards, always at very, very low prices, constant pressure down on the prices that, that they pay. So the retailers tend to offload those, the suppliers, sorry, tend to offload those pressures onto workers. Workers are often the safety valve for them uh, where they can offload those downward cost pressures. But at the same time, they've still got to meet those quality standards. So, so there's a constant tension that plays out. And this is a contested space in which different actors are, are, um, are engaged at different points. And in those, that contested space, you have a number of different types of struggles. I mean, for a start, workers know exactly what they're producing. If you produce a branded good in a factory in India, for any of the main retailers, high street retailers in the UK now, you don't just produce the garment, the dress or the trousers, etc. You also put on the label of the retailer. You put on the... The, the price tag of the retailer. So you see exactly what it is that good is finally going to be sold for, and you put it in the final packaging. So it goes in, you will, it's packed in India as you will buy it in the store here. So there's, a, there's the knowledge and the information is, is quite strong amongst workers themselves and the ability to collectively organize, etc. And at the moment, there are a number of quite major campaigns going on in Asia, um, over, particularly over living wage, wages. There's also this issue that retailers, retail is a poor sector, and, and anyway, of course, in retail, we can't afford to pay good wages. Just, just if, you, if you all know Oxfam's 1%, 62, 62 individuals have the same wealth or more wealth than the rest of the world. 14 of those 62 are in retail. In other words, not far off, over 20%. Of them are in retail, so uh, including the head of Zara. So, so there's, there's, there's quite a few bucks hidden around. So this is just um, trying to really kind of map out the sort of gender inequalities across the value chain, um, and this is actually based on collecting data from a whole number of different sources. Um, are quite difficult to get that data. Uh, so the this is a, a kind of simplified value chain at the top. This is a food value chain. So it's a simplified value chain at the top, which you saw before. But 
but this is at different levels within the value chain. So based on data and information publicly available from companies and other sources, the vast majority, um, over 50% of all senior level across the value chain is male. Um, when you come across to the permanent supervisors and permanent workers, you get a mixed picture. Now, this is current data. This for the workers, so these three sections, the workers and the next level down, forget those two levels, this comes from audit data for 10 million workers, for which I anonymized, fully and aggregated. And what that shows in the food chain is that approximately in most segments of the value chain, uh, men and women, roughly 45 to 55 percent. It, it, this is indicative numbers. It's not, not, it's not um, kind of firm numbers, but certainly from the data that I've seen. It. Now, I would not be surprised from my own research if you went back 10 to 20 years, that would have come out blue. I know in some sectors it would have been blue. So we have seen a shift in the sort of supervisor and permanent workers from uh, male to female. As you come down to part-time and temporary, then it goes female. And when you come, that, that is predominantly female in all the insecure employment. So that really bears out the, 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 that it's all bad story. This bears out the potentially empowering part of the debate. And then when you come down to smallholders, uh, home workers, labor contractors, etc then it becomes much more mixed and it's much more variable across countries. So that just gives you an idea and, and logistics is straight down the middle. That data actually comes from a very big ILO study, difficult again to get the data, male at every segment of the value chain. So you can see a kind of, and then of course over the other end, the customers, to put everybody in the customers we know are 70% plus female, and I'm assuming women eat, so therefore, 50-50 uh, on, on the final customer, that's, the, so, sorry, the final consumer. So that just gives that sort of over, overview of, of uh, kind of the gender profile of the value chain. But to go back to that question about are women workers benefiting or not benefiting, then I really draw on um, the concepts of global, of economic and social upgrading and downgrading. Are um, are, are the conditions improving? When, when conditions, when, when suppliers move up a value chain, when they get to higher value activities in the value chain, do workers benefit or not? Um, and that raises the questions of the social upgrading or downgrading. So if they're benefiting, then they're getting better conditions, more equitable employment, um, better pay. If they're not benefiting, then they're getting this, this strong gender inequalities, uh, women are being concentrated in the precarious and insecure work, uh, their conditions aren't improving, they're not getting better pay. Um, but in trying to analyse these two, and we've, through the Capturing the Gains programme, which I, I won't go into here, we did a lot, a number of different case studies where we were looking at these different dimensions in a whole number of different countries. Um, but what you could see is that there was no direct relationship. So in some contexts, women were definitely getting better off. In other contexts, they were definitely getting worse off. Um, and it really is very, very significantly by uh, the different kind of context in which the same value chain plays out. Um, and in part, it related to the kind of commercial pressures, which I've already discussed, this kind of cost versus quality low labor cost versus skill and productivity tensions, which I've already mentioned, but it also very much depended on the bargaining positions of workers. And that in, when you get contestation and bargaining, these are gendered processes where workers are able to find leverage points, make the alliances, uh, form different types of uh, campaigns, and those can vary, then you can see examples of improvement, but where they're not able to do that, then you often get um, the downgrading pressures. So ultimately, this isn't something that's going to trickle down. The benefits don't simply trickle down. They result from that kind of engagement. So just to give you a few examples, um, I, these are just brief examples. How am I doing on time? Another seven minutes. Okay, okay. So I can, these are just very brief. So. 
Um, economic and social downgrading in cocoa. So if you are chocoholics like me, I've done a lot of research over many years in cocoa. I don't know what drew me into cocoa. Anyway, if you eat chocolate, you'll know. Um, cocoa is a downgrading story through and through. Um, it really goes back to the 1980s, structural adjustment, um, dismantling of all the kind of the, 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 the uh, cocoa boards, etc., which protected cocoa farmers. Uh, the, since the 1980s, there's been a decline in cocoa prices, um, high levels of poverty um, in, amongst cocoa farmers. 70% comes out smallholder farmers in West Africa. Um, deteriorating conditions, problems in production. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It's all the downgrading story. Uh, supposedly, cocoa is a male crop, but the research that we've done shows that women do 45% at least of the work in cocoa farming. They also do the critical bits of the work in terms of productivity and quality. This decline, which has been going on, also led to what one form of contestation. Contestation can take different forms. It can be individual, it can be, be uh, collective, or an, and, and or it can be collaborative. The individual form is exit. You simply exit the situation in which your downgrading is taking place. And in cocoa farming, that has happened increasingly across swathes of, of, of West Africa in terms of younger cocoa farmers leaving cocoa farming. So there's a serious problem now of declining productivity, uh, exit out of, of, uh, out of cocoa farming. At the same time, as you've got significant expansion in the consumption of chocolate, particularly in Asia, China and India, where chocolate consumption has been going up at around 10% per annum. So you've got the decline in supply, increase uh, in demand, um, it, just globally, and about five years ago, Amajaro, who's one of the main cocoa traders, did a prediction, which is that by 2020, there's going to be a million, at current trends, there's going to be a million tonne shortage of cocoa. They're going to need, we're going to need four million tonnes. There will only be three million available on current trends. So if you like chocolate, start um, stocking up. What that, that was one thing that was going on. The other thing that was going on was Oxfam behind the brands. Oxfam did a big campaign where they got the main confectionery companies, they ranked them on a whole set of issues, and one of those issues was gender. I won't go too much into the campaign, like we can in the discussion, because there were some, I had some issues about how they did the ranking, but the point is they did rank based on publicly available data and information. And the chocolate com companies came out very badly, particularly some of them, that they weren't doing anything on gender. But why would you? Because anyway, cocoa's a male crop. Of course, what they weren't looking at is cocoa's a male crop. The cocoa farmer is male, i.e. the land, recognized land owner. And what they weren't looking at was who does the work. So the research myself and others um, did show that women actually do a large amount of work. So you had these two things going on simultaneously. And suddenly, the chocolate companies are faced with the fact they're going to have a million tonne shortage. They suddenly discover that women do all this work in cocoa farming. And you now have, in West Africa, large numbers of, uh, of initiatives, millions and millions of dollars, pounds, euros, being spent on these initiatives, both to support the livelihoods of cocoa farmers and to promote gender equality in cocoa farming. So that's an example of where you've had the downgrading pressures over a very long period of time. Different forms of contestation, both collaborative and individual, that then, then led to, um, to the kind of upgrading push. Now, whether or not that leads to improvements, we'd wait to see, but, but certainly. So just very briefly, time, I'm just thinking of which one? I won't be able to do all of them. I think just very briefly, um, again, the downgrading and upgrading pressures in garment work. And um, I think, again, this is an area where garments has been traditionally a downgrading industry, partly because it's so footloose. You can't just up and move your cocoa production to another part of the world. It takes you 
very few places that you can grow cocoa. There's um, uh, all sorts of limits on, on, on what you can grow where and uh, etc. And it takes five, at least five years to grow a cocoa tree. Garments you can up, up sticks, move a factory to, to uh, Jordan or another country, a very short notice, transport the workers across and, and move, it, move it around. So there's always long been downgrading pressures um, in garments. And of course, those downgrading pressures led to the, the collapse, uh, the Rana Plaza disaster, and over a thousand workers being killed. And that was absolute um, disaster, but it was a, ref it was a one off reflection of what had been going on for a very, very long time. So those downgrading pressures were leading to less and less safe work for factory workers in Bangladesh. And you have similar pressures elsewhere um, in. Um, in um, uh, many, many other garment producing countries. So that's the kind of contested outcomes, if you like. Now these pressures, there's, there's a whole range of strikes at the moment going on over living wage um, in Bangladesh just in the last few weeks. So there's a sort of wave of strikes which have been building in Bangladesh. So Bangladeshi workers, 80% female, traditionally seen as subservient, in inverted commas, passive, etc. They're not passive now. And, and that contested uh, outcome, if you like, is at least leading to campaigns for change. Whether or not that leads to change, we'll see. But this is a picture of a factory, um, in fact, in Vietnam, uh, where there is a major initiative to try and upgrade in order to get the better skills and quality. So whilst you can find plenty of downgrading pressures, there are also, to get the better skills and quality, um, some quite important upgrading initiatives that are taking place led some by multi-stakeholder initiatives. This particular one is led by the ILO Better Work pro uh, campaign or program, uh, but also led by a number of different retailers. So you're getting both the downgrading pressures and upgrading pressures. Now, where those play out, again, I would argue, depends to a large extent ultimately on the extent to which contestation and bargaining takes place in the value chain. More difficult in garments than it is, I think, in some ways, well, the difference is you, you can't generalize. But So just um, a few very quick reflections. So basically what I've argued is that you've got this significant shift that's taken place. What we've seen in Europe and North America is now taking place in, it has well t long taken place in Latin America and some countries in Asia. It is rapidly taking place in Africa too. So, um, uh, and within that, you get these upgrading, downgrading kind of pressure, where you get these, con these pressures for skill and price. So it's not just all cheap. It's got to be cheap with quality, and that creates a commercial tension. <laughs> But that plays out in terms of the, so the articulations, if you like, with the, with the sort of societal embeddedness in different ways and complex ways, but in ways where the bargaining processes and the types of alliances, individual, collective and collaborative, that are formed play an important role in, in ultimately leading to the shifts that lead to those improvements. I could have given more examples of that. One thing I haven't gone into and I think is really important um, and I'm working on at the moment is the role of the state in all of this. The state has traditionally been left out and in fact the states in most countries have usually just said there's nothing to do with us, it's, this is all the exporters. I think that's changing. Certainly the Bangladesh is a very good example of where the role of the state is being questioned and being kind of dr dragged in, I'm not quite sure that's the right word, but that it is being drawn into playing a more significant role under pressure and the complex ways in which that interaction also takes place. Uh, but also, very importantly, in terms of the governance, so it's not just the state on its own, it's what are the governance arrangements in these value chains where you have not only states should be playing a role, but also the companies clearly play a role, the big retailers, etc., but also civil society organisations. I mean, that Oxfam campaign made a massive difference, I think, in COCO. Uh, and there are many other examples like that that I could cite. Sorry, I went back for a bit. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, Paul, how about I give you five minutes to offer some reflections for us? Brilliant. Thank you. Um,
Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for, for a really excellent uh, presentation, and to the organisers for the for, for bringing Stephanie here, and also for the whole range of events you, you, you've put on around this. Um, so I'm a complete interloper here, being the lawyer uh, who who dabbles in questions of political economy and so forth. But listening to Stephanie, a number of um, a number of sort of neurons fired off about sort of general sort of I think probably important issues that your research maybe sheds light on uh, in a general. I think the first thing was that it was excellent uh, how you broke broke down the binaries between this is necessarily good, necessarily bad because this this quite often happens that there are simplistic narratives which says that the increasing employment of women in the in these uh, sectors necessarily leads to greater exploitation there's only one route and so forth so that was that was really helpful um there are just i suppose three three questions that i'll ask uh, things that would be useful for me to to sort of have clarified a little further um the first one and it relates to kind of the last point you made but also something you said at the start of your talk and you said we live in a post neoliberal uh, era um in light of Trump and, and sort of other developments. And then you mentioned towards the end the increasing role of the state or the state being dragged in. And so I suppose I wonder um, to what extent this is new or novel in any meaningful sense. So you, you gave the example of the state saying, oh, well, that's not to do with us, that's the exporters. But even that is a form of state action in that yeah. that's a decision by the state as to how it structures. Back. So I do wonder what what the sort of shift in climate is, this shift towards or from increasingly authoritarian neoliberalism to, I don't know exactly what we'll call it yet, we'll wait and see what Theresa May and Donald Trump and others do with this sort of paternalistic, uh, state-driven capital accumulation support network that they're developing. I'm not entirely sure how we classify it. It definitely represents a shift from the rhetoric of neoliberalism, but to what extent it represents a substantive shift from the substance of what was happening under the umbrella of neoliberalism for the last 30, 40 years. I'd be interested to see uh, what you think about that more generally, because that relates also, I think, to, um, you, you mentioned again at the start, you said how this process has taken place over the last number of years. I, I, somebody wrote a book about, I can't remember the exact year, it was in the mid-2000s, when for the first time in human history we tipped from a majority uh, rural global population uh -huh. to a majority urban. And so increasing urbanisation and so forth was one of the factors you identified. And you mentioned, that this may have just been a throwaway comment, that for so long as these processes continue, but they may not continue because of Trump. But I wonder again if you'd sort of reflect on that. To what extent are these processes reversible you know to, to what extent can the genie be put back in the bottle uh, in that sense if we'd want to or not and i suppose in keeping with the theme of sort of uh, rupture or, or, or the absence of rupture so you mentioned one of the key things that happens with these immense global values i don't know if anybody's ever um read the, the, the grapes of wrath or perhaps even just seen the film and there's a scene in it where a uh, muley who's a tenant farmer uh, in the in the book he's been uh, evicted from his property and the guy comes around to a victim and muley comes out with a shotgun and says i'm not going anywhere and the guy says don't shoot me uh, it's the bank manager who sent me here to do this and he says well i'll shoot the bank manager and the guy says well don't shoot the bank manager because it's the guy in detroit has told him to do it and it goes so so you mentioned that one of the things about these expanding global uh, global value chains was that it alters the relationship between exploiter and exploited between worker and between labor and capital and then i wonder to what extent that's novel as well i'm, I'm thinking of james Connolly's uh, workshop talks on socialism in 1905 when he talked about railroads that were being built in russia financed by capitalists from britain and france and the, you know so, so that that tension has always been there that, that sort of mm -hmm. tension between the relation between capital and labor has always been complicated and messy and very rarely been the neoclassical abstraction of somebody making a loaf of bread and taking it to market and so forth. So I wonder if you'd again sort of reflect on that. And then finally, um, I think I'd be remiss at SOAS not asking this question. So the, the, the focus on gender is really crucially important. Um, and then I was trying to, as you were talking about the differential impacts of these processes, mm -hmm. that in some places we see downgrading, in some places we see upgrading, uh, and it varies and there's lots of subjective factors as to why that might be and so forth. And I wondered if in your research, if you have the space or if it's something you've considered other valences of oppression. So what, what comes to mind is 
bell hooks is clunky but necessary phrase of the system we live under being one and i have to read it out because i forget i get it mixed up sometimes an imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy which is a clunky phrase but perhaps does capture the different layers and so i wonder so you mentioned coco uh, in west africa being one sector we've seen downgrading and so gender is one metric we can look at there but to what extent is that situated in the colonial past mm. in the sort of racial dimension the racial perspective i wonder if that's something mm. uh, you have space to to consider in your research and again it's it, you know the, the research for me is extremely helpful and a fantastic talk but again i just wonder if that is another dimension or a series of dimensions so i'll leave it at that because it's better to hear what the people who know what they're talking about have to say so. Great. thank you paul <laughs> Do you want to take a few minutes to respond to those and then we take some questions from the floor? Sure, just, just a quick response, because so, it'd be great to have time. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, I mean this, this is the issue, the, the kind of post-neoliberalism. Uh, I, I think that the first, I mean, clearly we live in a post-Washington consensus, so that kind of narrow sense of it, um, I think we've, we've moved on. Um, I think the trouble, the only problem for me is, is if, if you, you only look at it through a sort of an economic lens of markets, which I think many people still do, um, is you just miss a lot of what's really going on in terms of the commercial dynamic. Um, and particularly now uh, with, uh, f I mean, and that goes back to one of your later questions, which is, you know, what's the shift? Um, and can we put the genie battle in the, the genie back in the bottle? But if, if you if you're thinking of it as sort of a, a kind of Europe and North America, the sort of traditional imperialist colonial relationship between <coughs> Europe and North America and developing countries, um, even going back say 20 years, that has been that has been fundamentally changed by outsourcing, and China is clearly the example of that. So a lot of the firms now, the lead firms, are not European and American. They're actually, I mean, Tata, for example. Tata owns uh, Jaguar cars. It owns Tetley T. It owns British Steel, whatever it's now called, or uh, whichever, yeah, chorus, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, so, so a lot of those traditional kind of colonial relations are being changed. So I don't think you can ignore the past at all, because as I argued, it, these, these commercial processes are embedded in different social contexts, socio-economic contexts, and how those evolved is very important to understand, but not just to say, oh, well, it's all just sort of colonial past, because there are many more complex interactions now taking place, um, which, I mean, you know, often if you talk to, anyway, I won't go into, there are people in, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are quite aware of. Um, so I think there are sort of shifts taking place, and it's trying to understand that, not being too caught in, a, in the paradigms that we've used in the past and assuming that those will explain. Uh, where they do explain, continue to use them. But stop. I think on this issue of the urbanization and will these processes continue and the Trump thing, I mean, that's really, uh, I mean, it's very interesting for me that global outsourcing started in America um, and we, under Reagan, and we were the ones, the UK under Thatcher was the first to follow suit. And those two countries did it full scale, you know, outsourcing, closing down of industry, uh, sending services abroad, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's not pure coincidence, I think, that you've got Brexit and Trump in those two countries where the full effects of it were the strongest. Of course, people lost jobs, lost future, lost opportunities, and there's now a reaction going on again. So that's not a complete su surprise. Uh, whether where this will continue in the future, I think it remains to be seen because, of course, what you didn't have in the past, well, you didn't have the China-India card. Now, China and India are major economic, and well, all the BRICS, but those two in particular are major economic players now. I know working in Africa, I mean, all of the stuff over cocoa, it's because of what's going on in China and India. They're the big consumers. They're the, what driving the change and the pressures. So I think... Trump and May are trying, or May Bot or whatever we're meant to call her now, um, are, are trying to put the genie back in the model. Whether they are able to do it, I think there's a big question mark. Um, and, and of course, there could, could be a lot of fallout in tensions that arise as a result. Uh, but the other final big shift, I think the big shift in terms of the capital-labor relation is I agree with you that those kind of pressures, but on the whole, in most labor markets, not all, but most, uh, 
the capital labor relation was usually uh, contained at least to some extent within a kind of national labor market framework where the state did have a role or didn't, I mean, chose not to, and I completely agree with you, not playing a role is just it, deliberately not playing a role is a, is a strategy. It's not. Um, now, the big shift now is that actually from the value chain side is that, that companies thousands of miles away outside of the jurisdiction of that labour market can have quite a significant impact on what goes on in that labour market but there is no control over those companies that they, the government has no control over them. So I think that shift from the national to the global, which is again what Trump and people and Brexit are a reflection of a reaction against the implications of that. I think we live in a very uncertain world, but, but if we're not going, I don't think we're just going to go back to where we were 70 years ago. I know in 1970s, I know there are some people who would love that we could, but I just don't see that happening. Okay, great. Well, I think we'll Open for a few questions from the floor, and then we can continue that discussion. Who who'd like to ask a question? To raise your hands. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Those two. Um, yeah, no, I think that's the issue of the consumer. I didn't really go into it in a lot of detail. I've actually written a paper on it because we did a paper, it's in Environment and Planning A, on that side um, of it. And it's more complex. Uh, the, the drivers of fair trade in Africa, um, Asia, and Latin America, I mean, the, the, the uh, I mean, actually, in places like Bangladesh and India, you've often had, um, there's, there's been sort of small social movement base kind of ethical, fair, fair, fair without a certified um, movement. But I agree with you, it's tended to be fairly niche. I think those niches continue. I think the rise of the shift in retail, those retailers are also trying to now, that, that's where the growth market of fair trade is, is in retailers in Africa, Asia and Latin America. So for example, Fair Trade Africa is selling into Nakumat in, in Kenya. Um, you can get it in uh, Marks, in Marks and Spencer's in Woolworths, um, but and uh, Pick and Pay in South Africa. So they're developing relationships with supermarkets a bit like they did here. I mean, it's it's really going back very. It's very small, very nascent. The issue, though, about whether or not the shift in retail. It, you see, I don't think the shift is purely because consumers ask for it. I mean, every, the retailers here know that if you do a survey outside the supermarket and you ask everybody, would you pay 50p more for a fair trade label product? 
uh, very crude figures are 70% will tell you yes, 30% will tell you more. When those same consumers, five minutes later, walk through the door, get to the shelf, get faced by a thing of tea, 50p more, it's got fair trade, uh, done the non, 30% will buy it, 70% won't. And they'll do that within 10 minutes. And that is so, so well known. I mean, they track these things like hawks, so they know exactly. Uh, but so it, it's actually even more complex here than it is there. But there, there's a whole range of reasons why you sell fair trade. You know, the students buy fair trade, but they will only buy it maybe once a month or when the grant check comes or when they, they manage to pay off the debt to the bank or whatever, you know, they'll sneak it in. So, so it's, it's a whole complex range of reasons why people buy fair trade. The one thing they don't want anyone doing is going to another shop to buy fair trade because the second they go to another shop, they'll buy everything else there as well. So it's, it's complex. But the big thing that's driving it in Africa, it, outside of the supermarkets in, in Africa that, that do sell fair trade, is simply quality. They want quality products, even though they don't certify those products in any way. And requiring quality products with skill shortages mean you've got to improve labour conditions. Simple. So they're doing it. Not, not for consumer reasons, but for that reason. So there are kind of complex ways in which these things. On the role of entrepreneurs, yes. Now, that's a really big issue, actually. I didn't get time to go into it. Um, I think sometimes, ugh, I don't know, there's a thing, I, I mean, obviously working in development, you work a lot with, um, well, I do anyway, maybe I went and sold out too many years ago, but anyway, uh, with sort of some of the big kind of like the UN, it says. So UN Women, for example, at the moment is really focused on promoting gender in supply chains. Female entrepreneurs is what they're particularly focused on. Now, a lot of companies are very happy to do that because, you know, obviously this is promoting private sector engagement. So Walmart, for example, has a commitment, I can't remember the exact number, but that they will, you know, a, a significant amount of their sourcing will be from female-owned businesses. So, so there is quite a lot going on in relation to female entrepreneurs in many countries, across many countries, across the supply chain. My only worry about it is that it kind of diverts a little bit. I think it's great. I mean, I think it's really important. But it can sometimes be a sort of diversion from the fact that, that, that actually labour conditions, that's not where the worst labour conditions are necessarily. That, that's my concern. Right. I saw a hand there in the middle. Yep, Francesca. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a question on the relation between and class. And uh, you say that it's uh, better in terms of uh, the safety of the internet in the safety of the internet in the bargaining power of uh, workers mm -hmm. in the shop. And uh, I was wondering if you can explain as in the office or the concept to action and solving this inequality. Because the social upgrading uh, concept it doesn't take into account inequality as much. Social upgrading is about uh, increasing wage, better working conditions, mm. but it doesn't take inequality as such an account. Let's just mm. say that first, it does upgrade, it does capture more mm. value, but the social upgrading concept uh, doesn't take nothing about the distribution of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Because workers can gain even a, ra a rise in their wage or better working conditions, mm. but this doesn't take nothing about how much capital. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is pretty much mm -hmm. and it seems that the literature about uh, social upgrading uh, you see this economic upgrading mm -hmm. if there is economic upgrading it's a success mm -hmm. to be Mm-hmm. Was a question here? Yeah, I've got two. 
so neidisch auf diesen Menschen. Ähm, Wanted to add a, another quick thing. Did okay. yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. So, so my question actually is related to the the question about value, and I think related also to the to, to the question. I suppose again, there were so many fascinating points. But I suppose one thing that comes with, you made up, you give the example of grapes and the value chain that where we end up with grapes in the supermarket. And in that context, uh, you mentioned that or you, or you queried whether or not women ever actually get remuneration equivalent to the value they add to the mm -hmm. in that process. And I suppose the, the question I have is that is, isn't that fundamentally impossible? Mm -hmm. Because if they were getting remuneration equal to the value they were adding to the grapes, then it wouldn't be capitalism anymore, mm -hmm. it'd be something else. Mm -hmm. And then I think, so, so and very quickly, a related question, and this might just, uh, just if you can follow my sort of thinking on this and maybe clarify, one of the key processes you described was that the expansion of the retail uh, value chains, the expansion of w women's employment in the retail value chains was having the effect, or one of the effects of it was to commercialise um, home work in the home that women used to do historically. Mm -hmm. And I suppose thinking about the, the feminist literature and political economy and so forth, one of the arguments would be that this unrecognised and unpaid labour of women is part of what contributes ultimately, and I suppose this turns on what you mean by that value, is, yeah. uh, it contributes to the value or the, the share that capital ultimately uh, enjoys at the end. Mm -hmm. And is there a tension then in the increasing mm -hmm. uh, employment of women in these sectors, which therefore necessarily takes them away from the that historic, the historic work of social re or reduces the amount of that work of social reproduction which they can perform, mm -hmm. and so the retail sectors are creating products to replace work that women used to do. Mm -hmm. That work that women used to do was part of what generated the value for the firms yeah, in the yeah. first instance. Yeah. And does that create a tension, sort of imminent tension, in the whole process? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think the points that you're touching on are really critical points. Um, and and um, firstly, no, I agree with you that the economic and social upgrading concepts on their own, um, which really kind of come from that ILO decent work, it's really how do you define it? They're a framework. I don't think they conceptually help you to understand distribution. Um, so I completely agree with that. And that's where I think these, the, then that's a, that point that I really, I probably did, I did shift this, the, the order of the slides around because I wasn't quite really sure which way to do it. But that's the point at which that concept of articulations and the bargaining process, I think, is critical because that's where those distribution, that kind of, it, it's the fights, if you like. It's not simply a kind of a technical process of distribution. It, I mean, if you, even if you go back to pure economic analysis, in a value chain, certain players, commercial players, have oligopolistic control. And therefore, even they are able to extract, you know, they're, they're able to use that oligopolistic position in order to negotiate better terms and conditions. So even that on a pure free market analysis is not a free market because of that nature. So, so I would agree with that. I think the issue of value is a really tricky one and I don't think I've got the answer to it and I'm certainly not going to be able to get that in the book. Um, 
for me, the problem partly of how value is defined, and it kind of goes back to the point you're making, and that's why I think the, the feminist political economy, particularly the work of Susan Himmelwhite and Diane Elson's work, is really, really important in, in, the, in, in, for me, all of the different ways in which value is analysed theoretically, so that's uh, from the different sort of schools, has not fully understood or taken account of unpaid reproductive labour. I mean, that's really the core of the feminist, politi feminist argument against Marxist analysis, against Keynesian analysis, and against neoclassical analysis. And I think that's, for me, a really, really important part of it. Now, how you incorporate that in is tricky because exactly as you say, um, it's, it, I mean, in a sense, you can even go back to a sort of standard kind of market economy. Market economies are dependent largely on, on women's unpaid labour reproducing the labour force, which then goes into production into the standard capital labour relation, if you like. Uh, so in a sense, it's already, you've had that role there. What's changing to some extent is the way in which that reproductive labour is then being brought in and commercialised, but socially undervalued. So women are still, for, for societal reasons, producing food. Of course, we all know that anyone who produces food, it's a low-skill, low low-value activity. I still can't quite work out why the highest-paid chefs in the world are all men, but anyway, that's an aside. So in other words, it's not uh, necessarily, but societally it's been undervalued. Um, so that is a really tricky issue. I haven't got uh, an answer to it. I know that, I mean, the, the, I, I do agree with, and that goes back to that earlier question, the first piece of what you said, which is in this kind of oligopolistic situation, there are what Rafi Kaplinsky calls the economic rents. I mean, the Nike example is such a good example. You have two pairs of shoes being produced in a factory, at the same factory. They both look the same. They feel the same. The design, slightly different design in one and a few other differences, but they're pretty minor. You're going to pay $100 more for the Nike shoe than you are for the other shoe because it's got a tick on it. Now, which theory of value fully, for me, there is no theory of value that I've seen that really unpacks why the tick and a few other accoutrements are worth $100 more than the shoe. The same, almost the same shoe without the tick and the, a few accoutrements. Nike would dispute that, by the way. They would say, but there's major differences. Well, not, not, I'm not sure. Um, so, so I don't think there's any theory of value that really ex um, um, explains that in my view, and then when you bring the fact that shoes may be a bad example, garments would have been a better example with a tick on a, on a t-shirt, for example, produced by, it's just that more men work in shoe production, so that would have been maybe 80% women, and anyway, everybody knows that, that, that producing garments is a, is, is a low value activity, but again, I still can't quite work that one out when you get some of the highest paid kind of you know, uh, so, um, you know, uh, I've got the word, but haute couture or whatever you want to call it, um, is very highly paid. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a tension, and, and I, I haven't got an answer to your question. I think it's a really important question. It's one I battle with. Um, I can find what's wrong with the theories. I haven't got the replacement theory, if you like. But I think one of, in some ways, I've actually gone back to looking at some of the theories of unequal exchange and how, if you get this economic rent, how it then gets divided out. But then the only way I can see in that is, again, it comes back to this bargaining process. So I, that's where I am at the moment. But it's a good question. I haven't got the answer to it. Very important question as well. Okay, we've got another couple of hands I can see. So this will be the last round. So, okay, you. Mm. Mm. And also in terms of uh, we talked about the 
Thank you. Yeah, in the back there in the blue. question here in the corner by the window. There was one question earlier that I forgot to pick up on, which is how do you maintain um, the gains if you do make them? And I think that's a really important question. Um, and, and that is a big problem in, the, in precarious work because, you know, I mean, just taking the, I mean, that's a very simple one, but um, great workers know, they, you see, they know everything that's going on. Don't forget, they, they know what the orders are. They know what's going out. They've put the, te the Tesco label on the bag. They know exactly what's going on because they do it. Um, and the, the the classic thing in Chile, for example, is we don't, I mean, workers told me we don't need an, a union when we know when the pressure's on. We just do that. In other words, you just slow the process down. And, and by slowing the process down, they can get all sorts of gains and, and really do well. The problem is, as soon as that pressure's off or the season changes, those gains go. So, so how to sustain the gains is, is a major challenge in these highly precarious types of, of work. Um, and, and I think, and I haven't gone in, didn't go into state, but that's why a number of people are arguing now that the state needs to come back in and play more of a role. But I think there are big issues there because it's not straightforward. Um, it, it, going back, I think, is, no, is not the solution. Um, the, there are, sorry, I got a bit messy here. So um, I think the points that you made uh, about the kind of links between producer and consumer is an important one. And I, there, there is, I mean, it is quite interesting with um, the iPhone, oh, well, sorry, the smartphone has made a big, do, and, I mean, the iPhone's one, but of course Samsung is Korean. So, I mean, again, that's another example. It's not a European and, or North American um, company. Um, but the smartphone, I think, has made a big difference in terms of, of creating the linkages. Um, and those have been created more and more. And just as, I mean, smartphones are available at the moment still with um, higher income consumers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But as you know, with mobile, wherever generation we're on now will soon be. The second will will move on to another generation. Those will become second hand, and then they're very rapidly repaired, 
um, and, uh, you know, resuscitated and sold back in within Africa, Asia and Latin America. So, I mean, I've been in parts of Africa which, you know, I mean, very small. I mean, I'm working cocoa, goodness. I've been to villages. They've got no water. They've got no no road to get you on a dirt track for miles and miles and miles and when the rainy season it's unpassable you go there's no electricity there's no school there's no health clinic but they've all got mobile phones or access to because it's not just owning one it's having access to which is really important particularly in community context and that it, those mobile phones have enormous amounts of information which is already being passed through and that only increases so the connection between the producer and the consumer is being shortened even within Africa, Asia and Latin America. Now, how that will play out, again, it's difficult to know, but you can see the shifts going on. Um, I should just say in the, the, the 14 retailers that I mentioned up there in um, you know, Oxfam, 62 people own more wealth than the rest of the, pop the rest of the world put together. One of them is uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and another one is Jack Ma, Alibaba, which is the Chinese equivalent of Amazon. So it's not just um, North, you know, a European, North American. You can see the shifts that are going on. Um, how is the female employment measured? There, there's a number of people who work on that and it's quite, quite I mean, obviously you can do it through just numbers. Um, the the problem, and, and there is, I mean, just simply labor force participation. Now the problem with the data is the data is usually based on labor force surveys, which are national surveys. It doesn't tell you what percent, it, two things it doesn't tell you, what percentage of, of uh, that goes through value chains, so that we don't necessarily know. Um, and then the second thing it doesn't tell you is that a lot of what does pass through value, value chains link not just the top tier supplier that might be involved with the export, but also many lower tiers as well, the input suppliers in, and that isn't available in the data. Uh, because of that, and because 60 to 80 percent of all world trade now passes through value chains, that figure is from the OECD, UNCTAD, and the WTO jointly. They were, uh, they they did that work. They now have a project called the TIVA, the Trade in Value Added, Trade in yeah, TIVA, Trade in Value Added program, which is trying to do this measurement, and they're now working on the labour side of that. How do you measure employment within value chains? They're using um, input-output analysis to try and do it, but there are a number of problems, again, with using input-output analysis. So there is a lot of work going on on trying to do that measurement. It is difficult because the data is just not there. Um, in, in a sort of classically, a, a tradition, the, the, the traditional ways in which that data is collected is based on national labour markets, and so it doesn't give you the value chain picture. The ILO also has a team working on it and they're working with the OECD which is what houses TIVA, where TIVA is housed. Um, and those are mainly econometricians who are working on trying to collect that data. But So there is data but it's not, not very good, but they're, 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 they're working on it. And then the final point about the, um, the technology, oh gosh, so bots, fox bots, which do you want to call them, um, automation um, uh, and, and 3D printing. Um, you know, we'll all be producing our own clothes at home soon. We won't need to go to a shop. Um, I mean, obviously, if you talk to some of the tech, tech people, that's going to take over and the whole world's going to change and we can all go out and, what's it, Mark said, we were going to swim in the morning, fish in the afternoon and, you know, whatever. I, sorry. Um, it's going to, that poten potentially has a very disruptive effect. I mean, the sobots, uh, that's robots put into sewing factories, um, into garment factories, is already happening. Um, and you can reduce the number of workers significantly, very significantly. I've seen it in fruit as well. I didn't show the South Africa one, but I mean, you know, a lot of those pack houses now are being automated slowly. Um, I was in one not very long ago, um, and it was all just, it was all being done by they, these laser eyes. The laser eyes do all the sorting and, and gathering out, and etc. They do still use manual labor for the last bit of the process, but enormous amount. Um, so it's going to have a big effect, uh, effect on labor. Now, the gender impacts of that are going to be mixed. 
uh, that South African pack house factory, I was up on a big gantry looking down and watching this amazing process going on at enormous speed. And they had all these small um, uh, pickup trucks, um, that, forklift trucks, quite small ones that were going around doing the shifting from the different lines. And I suddenly realised one of them had a woman in it. You know, South Africa, a woman in a forklift truck. No, that's not, no, 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 we shouldn't allow that. Sorry, I'm being facetious. And, I, and then I realised another one had a woman in it. So I said, well, why, how come we've got women in forklift truck? I mean, I've been told for so many years women shouldn't drive fat. In South Africa, women should not, because clearly, genetically, we, we weren't what, geared to, to doing things like that. And, and in fact, the, probably it was about 50-50 male and female. They found that the women forklift dr truck drivers were better than the women. It's all computer controlled. But the, this issue of the kind of skills, and in fact, the soft skills, so that they were just a lot more gentle in the way they did the lifting. And, and uh, Marion Werner's work in Dominican Republic uh, on the kind of um, new technology in garment production, um, you, ironically there, she found that you had an increase in male employment on the production, on the, on the, on the labour-intensive piece of the production as they increased the automation, but an increase in female employment on the more automated parts where you needed a higher skill level. Uh, that wasn't the same worker because you had to have a degree to go into that level. But, so it's going to be, again, complex and it's going to play out differently in different places, but there is some evidence in Asia where you've got the automation, it's leading to uh, defeminization in some parts of Asia. So different studies are showing different things, but it's that that potentially forget Trump and Brexit. That's going to be a big challenge, I think. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us this evening and having such an illuminating discussion. I'd like to take an opportunity to to thank Stephanie. Oh, thank you. Thank you.